Welcome to Amazing Discovery Sabbath School class. My name is Robert Blaze, and I'll be studying the scripture with you. This quarter, we're going to be looking at one of the most important topic in the life of a Christian and the church, and that is personal evangelism. We're going to be looking at things like witnessing and giving testimonies, intercession, how to minister to the needs of different people, how to share the gospel, right here on ABT. Welcome back again to Amazing Discovery Sabbath School. We have a great lesson today, actually a very important lesson. So let's begin with prayer that God may fill us with His Spirit. Father, we come to you again today. For Lord, there is nowhere else that we can go to. For Father, you have the word of life. And these very words we need to study, Lord, and we need to share. But we cannot do it, Father, unless you give them to us and unless you give us your Holy Spirit. Because only Him can guide us into all truth. And Father, today as we open Your Word, I ask and I plead, Lord, that You give this precious gift, the gift of Your Holy Spirit, so that, Lord, our minds and our hearts may be guided in the right direction, that we may comprehend against um, the things that we will read, Lord, and the things that we will understand, that they, we may be guided ar along divine lines and not human lines. Help us, Lord, to be completely emptied of anything that is human and filled with divinity at this time. I thank you, Father, for giving us this gift. Let our minds and our hearts, our ears and our eyes be ready, Lord. And I ask especially at this time, Lord, that you cleanse me fully and completely. For, Lord, I, I, I am not worthy of speaking on your behalf. And so I pray that your words be in my mouth and that... The only words that I speak are your words. And forgive me, Lord, all my sin. Forgive us all of our sins. And I thank you, Lord, for being generous with your grace. And I pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, and our righteousness. Amen. So just before we move on to our lesson, let's review a little bit of last week. We talked about sharing the story of Jesus. And we realize and remember that Jesus is actually the center and the actual, the, the whole basis of our testimony, the changes that we experience is because of him. He came to change us and the changes, the transformation that we experience it because of him and what he has done. We went from being dead in sin to dead to sin so that we may, um, be alive unto God and unto righteousness and live victorious life. And since only dead people cannot sin, God had to find a way for us to both be dead to sin and yet alive at the same time in righteousness. And he achieved that by what Jesus has done. What he's done on the cross and the fact that he was raised in righteousness so that we can also be raised in righteousness. Jesus was raised incorruptible freed from um, the, the, the pressure of sin, that we may experience the same things. And we've seen that such changes can be seen in the life of John, in the light of Peter, in the life of Paul, because they had an encounter with Jesus, and they embraced it, and Jesus changed and transformed their lives. And finally, we looked at how our testimony actually is the beginning of the sharing of the gospel. And we need to be sharing the gospel, and Jesus is at the center of that gospel, of course. It is Jesus and the cross, but it is, of course, a lot more. Today, we're looking at a, a message worth sharing, and our memory text is found in Revelation 14. So I'd like to invite you to go there, Revelation 14, and we'll first read verse 6 and 7. Um, and we're only going to talk about verse 6 because after that we're going to enter into more depth into that wonderful passage. And so it reads in verse 6, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, 
and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Now, like I said, we're going to be looking at the whole passage of Revelation 14, 6 to 12 in more depth. But first, it's, you know, before we look at the actual content of the message, we'll look at what uh, we need to understand about the message first. It begins with the expression, I'm going to put that on the board here, everlasting gospel. And so the message of Revelation 14 is the everlasting gospel. It means that it lasts forever. And you know, the, the thing with everlasting is it's not just something that reached in the future eternity, but it also reaches in the past eternity. It goes back all the way. Because we're finite being, it's, it's kind of a little hard to understand. I mean, we can kind of like conceptualize the idea of going in the future forever. But to go in the, fu in the past forever, that's a, it's a little bit harder for us because we, we all came to a beginning. We, we can trace back where we started and then we can imagine that we can go on forever. But the idea that it's always been there, that there is no past, no beginning, it's a little harder for us to understand. And that only works because God has no beginning. And because the gospel is without beginning, the very subject of the gospel, which is Jesus, is also without beginning. He has always been and never had a beginning nor a birth. He is like God the Father and the Holy Spirit. He has always been and always will be. And so the gospel, the good news of salvation, will be something that will be forever the subject of study and amazement. And if it's going to be like that forever, it should definitely be like that now, the subject of study and, of course, amazement. So now, the other aspect of uh, the gospel is the recipient of what we're going to learn here. It, it tells us, okay, that it's, it's been there for eternity, but it has a specific recipient. The message is for someone specific. It says it's for those that dwell on the earth. So it is for, obviously, us. It is for humanity, for every living being that ever lived, that lives, and that will live. It's for everyone. It's, it's very specific and at the same time it's very inclusive the writer expands that by using four different categories. he says to every nations every kindred every tongue and every people so that's actually very important we need to understand that Nation, well, it means every nation, whatever the political landscape can be, wherever that nation is located, that gospel is for them. To every kindred, that means it doesn't matter what race or what culture people may be, that gospel applies to them. For every tongue, the language is not a barrier. It's for every language. And finally, for every people, that means that whatever, it's for the individual for me and for you individually, no matter what our social class may be. The gospel is all-inclusive, no exception. No one is beyond its claim and its reach. And praise God, because the gospel is so important. It is life. And without it, there is no life. So today our, our study will be divided like so. We're going to first talk about present truth. And that's very important. A lot of people do not realize that there is such a thing as a present truth, and that's very important. And then we're going to look at the context of what we call the three angels' message, right? Which is what we found in Revelation 14, 6 to 12. But there's more to that message. And if we understand the context, it will help us. And finally, we're going to look at the three angels' message itself which is actually very important. 
And so let's talk about present truth. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1. We'll read, that, we'll read verse 12. 1 Peter, 2 Peter, sorry, chapter 1, verse 12. Peter says, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of, the, of these things, though you know them, and be established in the present truth. So Peter here speaks of present truth, and he says two important things. First, he says that present truth is something that we should know, right? And second thing, he says that present truth is something that we should be established in, meaning we should be well-grounded and founded in it, meaning we should be solid in it. But despite that, despite the fact that we should know and be grounded in, sol in present truth, Peter says that he would not be negligent to put us in remembrance, meaning that that's, that's a teaching that needs to be continually and consistently be brought to our attention, be brought to our mind, to be pondered upon and to be remembered. <clears throat> and so if you remember something, that means you are you know, making a diligent effort to ponder and to dwell and to do that. It's not just something that comes up to your mind like that. You make an effort, and that's very important. Peter says that if he wouldn't do that, if he wouldn't put it in, remember, in remembrance, he would be neglectful. It would be negligence on his part. So if that would be negligence on his part to remember, for, for, us, for him to make us remember, then it would so be negligent for us not to take time to remember as well. And then he uses the word always. So it's not something that you do once in a while. It's something that you do regularly, always, always remembering what present truth is all about. And so it demands consistent, frequent effort, study, and reflection. So then, what is present truth? Well, to put it simply, it's, it's subject matters that are especially important at the present time. And so present truth may not always be the same at different time. It doesn't mean that, let's say, truth from the past are no longer important, but their emphasis may not be as um, emphasized, I guess like I'll use that, emphasized as it should be at a different time. Its significance is especially relevant at a specific time. Let me give you a for example. Think of Noah's day, right? Noah's day, Noah's present truth was the judgment is coming, a flood will come and destroy the world, enter the ark, that is your only hope of salvation. Now that was present truth in Noah's time. Now things like salvation, hope, judgment um, are, are general themes and they, they always are present truth. But the fact that a flood was to come and that an ark was the source of salvation, that was present truth there at that time. Doesn't mean we can't learn from it. Of course we can, but it's not the same thing. It was the present truth for Noah's day. We don't preach today, get into the ark, because there is no ark. That is not our present truth. Um, think also of the literal Babylonian captivity, right? Again, there are certain elements for us to learn from, but we are not going to be brought physically captive to, a, to the Babylonian empire. That is not present truth. That was present truth for Israel then. Now, there are lessons for us to learn, but it's not the same thing. Now, in Peter's time, there was a present truth, and we'll read what it was in 2 Peter 1, 15 to 21. He says, Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we have made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And the voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. So here Peter establishes that the coming of Jesus, that specific event that took place, 
his first advent, his incarnation, the witnessing that he had, the fact that he was there and all the ministry that he's done, Peter says that that was present truth. Of course, today, we don't have that physical presence of Jesus. So it is not, we don't preach it the same way. We talked about his incarnation. We talked about what he's done, but it's limited to what it is now. So the ministry of the long-awaited Messiah of his first advent, that was Peter's present truth. He goes on saying, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So a second admonition is to pay attention to the prophecy, especially the prophecy that were pointing to Jesus' first advent. Again, we're not saying that those prophecies are no longer important to us, but they're no longer the same present truth. We still talk about them. We still preach them. We still establish Jesus through them and the whole plan of salvation. But there's a different emphasis today. We talk about them, but it's not the same emphasis of present truth. Now we're going to talk about what the present truth is for us these days. And that's what we found in Revelation 14. So before we actually talk about the message itself, I think it's worth looking at the context of Revelation 14. See, the, the everlasting gospel that is found in verse 6 to 12 actually has a, a bigger context. The immediate context would obviously be the whole of Revelation 14. However, Revelation 12, 13, and 14 work together as a whole. And through that passage, you get a, a sweep of history from the beginning of the war that started in heaven all the way to the end time when Jesus comes again a second time and brings his people home. And so you have this great controversy that is expended in these three chapters. So in chapter 12, you have the war that begins in heaven. You have the coming and the ascension of the Messiah. And then you have the early church and the time of persecution that extends until the modern days. Then in chapter 13, you have there described a religious and political power that is uniting for the final time of persecution of the people of, the, of God, of the church. And then you have chapter 14, and chapter 14 is divided in three parts. And so we're going to look at the first part, the last part, and then the middle part. So verses 1 to 5, it says, And I look, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their forehead. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song, before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand, which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruit unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now there's a lot to talk about in that um, passage, but we'll condense it to, you know, pull out the important point, but it's worth your study. So this first passage described the condition of the true people of God right before the second coming of Jesus. These are known as the 144,000. And these are the final representative of the remnant church, and the Bible describes them with very strong terms. It says that they have the Father's name written in their forehead, meaning that we know that name represents character in the Bible. And so they have the character that is like, like the Father, like Jesus, like Christ. They have righteousness all over them. And 
we know that if you, you would go back to uh, Revelation 7, that these people are actually sealed, meaning that they're not moving from who they are. Now, this is interesting because the, this is actually contrasted with the, 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 what we found in Revelation 13. Because in Revelation 13, the people there actually receive the mark of the beast on their forehead and on their hand. So now you, you have this division between two people, one that have the mark of the beast and one that have the name of the Father, which is the seal of God on their forehead. It says further that they follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth, meaning that they have complete trust in Jesus and they obey fully. They do everything that is commanded to them. They have a song that no one else can sing because they have, they have had an experience that is unique to them. Because songs are about experience. And so they have this experience where they went through great tribulation, great difficulty, and they finally came to a point where they uh, attained, yeah, these people have attained what we're all looking for, and it's to have Christ-likeness and righteousness given to them. And so this is a song of thanksgiving and of experience and glorifying God for what he's done. It says that they are a virgin, meaning that they have a pure religion that is undefiled by woman. And woman means churches. And so they, they have not fallen in false system of worship. Their truth and their doctrine and their beliefs are pure. It says that they are the first to be redeemed, meaning that they will see Jesus come the second time. And they will be the first one to be welcomed by Jesus and to be saved. They are the first fruit. And they are the first root even before those that will be raised from the grave. And finally, and this is so important, in the last verse it says that in their mouth was found no guile, and that they are without fault before the throne of God. Now, if you understand this, in 1 Peter 2, 21 to 22, we read here about Jesus. And look at the, it's not a contrast, it's a comparison. It's the similarities Verse 21 says, For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. And what's an example for? Well, it says here that you should follow his steps. So Jesus left an example that we should follow, and look at what it says. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. That's the same description that we have at the 144,000. They are just like Jesus. So by the time Jesus comes, they have attained and they are like Jesus on earth. They're, they're there, they're alive, and they're waiting like Jesus. Then, of course, after this passage of, of verses 1 to 5, you have a description of the final message to the people on earth, which is known as the three angels' message. It's from 6 to 12, but we're going to skip that to look at the last passage of Revelation 14, which is verses 13 to 20. And it's a little long, but let's read it together so that we, we get the whole context and idea. It says, And I heard a voice from heaven, and remember, this is after the message has been declared. So you have the people that will be coming just like Jesus. You have the message that is being given right before Jesus comes. And then you have what's going to happen when Jesus comes. It says in verse 13, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, said the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And upon the cloud sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Trust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud trusted his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple, which is heaven, in heaven, and he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Trust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the cluster of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. 
And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. Wow, now, now that's a, a mouthful and a lot of stuff in there. But basically what we have is we have two reaping. The first reaping are from the one that sits on the cloud, the one that is like the Son of Man. That's Jesus. So at his coming, he reaps. And what he reaps is the redeemed from the earth. This depicts the second coming where all the saved will be from Adam all the way to the end time where the 144,000 are, will be read from the earth. They will be glorified and brought to heaven. The second harvest, the second reaping, shows what will happen. It's, it's the final destruction of, of those that decided to remain in sin, the sinners, and have not accepted the salvation of Jesus. And so they are destroyed because of um, having refused to let go of sin and to embrace righteousness. So this is what the message is about. This is basically a, a, an end time picture of, um, of hell, if you will, of, of what will take place when everything comes to an end. And so between the 144,000 and the final destruction, you have sandwiched in between the description of the final message of Jesus and of heaven and of God to earth, to the people. These, these things really describe very well what will take place at the end of time. And so now let's take a look at the three angels and what the everlasting gospel is really all about. Because we, we've looked at who it is for, but what's more important is what it's about. So first, just so you know, we call it the three angels' message because they are three angels proclaiming a message. Six and seven is the first one. Verse eight is the second one. And nine to 12 is the third message. Now, one thing to note is that these are not literal angels. Okay, they're not actual, you know, flying beings from heaven. The message comes from heaven, right? But remember, the word angel simply means messenger. And so anyone that has this message becomes a messenger. So I am a messenger who has this message. And when you have that message, you also become a messenger. This is the message that's been given from heaven to us in the last days. It is present truth for us today. And those that need to proclaim that message is God's last day people. It's God's last day church because God gave that message to them. And so let's go back to Revelation 14 and let's read verses 6 to 12. Let's start with the first angel's message in verse 6 and 7. It says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. Now, we, we've already looked at the first part, and we understand that it's a message for everyone. But it's interesting because it says that he has this message, and it needs to be preached having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. Now, a lot of people will say, well, I can't preach. Well, preaching means to proclaim, right? There's many ways to proclaim, but the message needs to be proclaimed. It needs to be brought out there. It needs to be spoken out. It, it's not something um, that is only for the elitist, you know, for a certain group of people. It is not a secret message. It's not cultic. It's not um, some, something for secret society. It's something for everyone, and it needs to be proclaimed broadly, widely, and openly. Now, the other thing that says is when, it, when we go to verse 7, it says that he proclaimed it, he said it with a loud voice. 
So again, here you have an emphasis on the importance that this message need to be heard by everyone. Now, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean shouting. That's not what it means. It means to speak decisively and convincingly. You need to be convicted of that very message. And you have to make sure that no other noise around chokes down what you're trying to say, right? It has to be clear, it has to be defined. Doesn't mean to, that it's loud above, loud above everything else. It's just, it is not uh, you know, being muttered by anything other than the message itself. Now, just so you know, we already spoke about the gospel itself last time we were together. Right? We talked about the cross, we talked about the incarnation, we talked about the resurrection, and we talked about uh, receiving grace for victory, and, and these are all included in there. It is still present truth today, but there's an expansion to the importance of what the gospel is all about. And so, remember, just go and review Romans verses 1 through 7, and there you'll, you'll have an expansion of the whole gospel, the incarnation, the resurrection, and all these things. Now here, Revelation 14 has some other very specific element that are important for us today. And so this present truth is crucial for us to understand, and you'll notice how it is so well applicable today. He starts, the angel starts, by saying, fear God. And that is actually very relevant today. If you think about it, we live in an age today where um, more than any other time before, God and, and even other supposed deity that are not real deity have been extremely downplayed. They're mocked, they're disbelieved, they're ignore they're not taken seriously right they're they're putting they're put aside as fables and myth for people of you know ignorance or low education or don't know anything right unscientific mind if you will or worse something else that is being done is gods are being humanized now i'm not talking about incarnation i'm talking about relationship-wise, like where we, we come to the point that we make God like an everyday guy, an everyday person that we would meet on the street, like a buddy type of person. You know, sometimes you, you hear that in prayers where, where, yes, God is our friend, but he's still God, he's still Lord, he's still creator, he's still king. And yet, people will talk to God as if he's like just their little buddy there that they they, you know, they talk to every day. There is no respect. You know, we don't glorify God. A lot of time you, you can hear that. Think of CCM, right? Contemporary Christian music. CCM today, if, if you listen sometime to the lyric, you'll realize that it's frighteningly familiar in the sense that some of those songs you could be singing those songs to your boyfriend or your girlfriend and it'd be fine. You wouldn't know the difference. You don't even know that these songs are actually sang to God because God is not elevated to his godhood. He's being brought down to the level of humanity in this idea of being familiar. We forget that God is God. God above all, king of all king, and reverence, and yes, a certain amount of healthy fear is not inappropriate. In fact, it's very appropriate. And so, because the message starts with that, it is very relevant because it tells us of the way that we look at God today. And we don't look at him the way we ought to look at. So, this message is there to place People's, um, place the people's in relationship to God properly. It fixes the perspective that we have. It gives the right um, uh, relationship between the creature of whom I am and my God who is the creator, whose life he holds in his hand. The next part of the message says, give glory to him. So give 
glory to him. And this is the idea to recognize who God is, especially in relation to us, and what he has done to us, and what he is still doing for us. It is about being thank thankful for everything that he supplies, everything that he does. Again, we, we live in an age where there's a lot of talk about self, right? Where we aggrandize ourselves. You know, you, you hear about this self-made, -made, self-made men ideas, and all type of success and accomplishment that the human has accomplished, the human has done, not realizing that there's a God around. We talk about independence. Oh, we have to be independent. We cannot you know, depend on anyone, certainly not on a God. We talk about self-sufficiency, self-esteem, where we should have God-esteem. And all these things, we forget that if it wasn't for God, we wouldn't have anything and we would be nothing. The next portion talks about the hour of his judgment is come. So judgment is come. So as we go down that message, we learn that the time where God will sit down and judge between the righteous and the unrighteous, the one that are Christ-like and the one that are Satan-like, is not just coming, it's now come. It is there. And so based on their profession of faith will be determined their outcome, their future, their eternal destiny. It's no longer a future time. It's no longer like something that we look forward. It's something that is here now today. It is present truth at the present time. It is a rea reality and it is taking place. Now the next passage of the message tells worship him again very very relevant and important and you know what only once we recognize that these things are happening that worshiping him makes sense knowing that we need to fear God to give him glory for what he's done and that judgment is upon us right not has come or will come and is it is come then worshiping start to make sense there's a lot of worship today but they're not the worship of god they're their worship sometimes of religious system their worship of stars in the entertainment industry of famous people we worship ideas and success and money you know what idolatry is there there is a great definition here that i found in Manuscript 126 in 1901, it says, anything, anything that is made the subject of undue thought and admiration absorbing the mind is a God chosen before the Lord. And so anything that, you know, place our mind, place our thoughts above God's or that, that places something or someone between us and God, that's an idol. And there is a lot of idol worship today. The next passage tells us the one that made, right? He's the one that we have to worship. Worship him that made heaven, earth, the seas, and the fountains of water. And that's also a very crucial part of the message. Because what it tells us here is that, yes, there are many people that claim that they worship God. And they worship God in all sorts of different manner, in all sorts of different ways. But here we are called at the time of the end to worship him as the one who made heaven, earth, the seas, and the fountain of water. We are called to worship the creator. Interestingly, it doesn't tell us to worship the Redeemer, not that that's not an important position, but rather to worship the Creator. And that is so important because when you read Revelation, you start to understand how that the, the, the work of creation, the Creator, is so important. Look in Revelation chapter 4. Verses 8 to 11 tells us, And the four beasts 
had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day nor, uh, and night, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those bees give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the thrones, saying, and let's just pause for a moment, here you have a scene in heaven. You have a scene of worship from heavenly being, unfallen being, people that have never tasted sin, they are worshiping God. And now we're going to find out why they worship God. It says in verse 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. You see, heaven calls us to worship God as creator, why? Because they themselves worship God as creator. And, and we've lost this today because we don't believe in a creator. We, a lot of people out there believe in evolution, a self-made universe without a God to look over them. But now that's interesting because in the, Reve in the Revelation 14, 6, where it says to make heaven, earth, seas, and the fountain of water, that formula is actually the formula that is used in Exodus 20. As we read verse 8 through 11, this is what we read. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy men servant, nor thy maid servant nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea, and all that is in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So the, the formula used here in the everlasting gospel is actually a throwback to the commandment of Sabbath keeping in Exodus 20. And even that uh, passes of Exodus 20 actually quotes back the passage of Genesis chapter 2. Um, notice with me in verse 1 to 3 it says, Thus the heaven and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God had created and made. And so here you have the last day message that brings you back to the commandments of God that eventually points you back to the creation in the beginning of time. The last day message actually brings you back to the creation in the beginning for us to remember where we come from and we come from the hands of God who spoke and everything came into existence. It's a call back to the worship of the creator. It actually comes full circle. And so, now that we look back, in a nutshell, the first angel message means to give back to God the position that he's entitled to. And that is for us to remember who he is and our true relationship to him. That he is God and we're not. We're just men. But he is God. Now, this is so crucial and important, but there's two more messages that come out there. This is present truth, definitely present truth, definitely important, but there's more. There's a second angel that comes in verse 8, and we read, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And so here, we learn that Babylon is fallen. Now, of course, this is not a representation of Babylon of old. Babylon here stands as a figure of false system of worship, and they're led by the great Babylon. But now this great Babylon has now fallen, and meaning that they're no longer a safe place to worship, and quite frankly, they never were, 
but it is important for now for men to really truly understand you can no longer remain in that false system of worship known as Babylon, especially considering the things that are coming now upon us at the end of time. And so this is a short message, but an important one, because it sets up the final message, the third angel's message. And that one is in two parts, and it is a very serious warning. That's the first part. But the second part is about hope. And so let's begin. It says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever. And they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Now, again, if you've noticed, this is again declared with a loud voice, meaning, again, it should not be muffled by any other message out there. You see, when you, when you read Revelation 13, it talks to you about the mark of the beast. And it says that if you don't get the mark of the beast, you'll be killed. In order to get the mark of the beast, you have to worship the beast. Now, it doesn't sound like a good arrangement, but it doesn't look like there's any real consequences of not following along. It, you know, there's no consequence. It's not a, it doesn't look such, like such a bad thing. But when Revelation 14 comes along in the third angel's message, now you realize that there's a contrast and there's actually a battle, a fight between two things. There's a fight of worship. There's a worship of God that we're called to go back to, and there's a worship of the beast that is enforced upon the people. And those that are receiving, uh, that actually goes along with the worship of the beast, receive the mark of the beast which allows them to continue to buy and sell and to not be killed. However, when you get to Revelation 14, you realize, uh, for example, the 144,000 have the seal of God. They have the name of God on their forehead. They don't have the mark of the beast, so they've taken a different path. And we realize that these people put their lives in danger because if they don't have the mark, they might die. But here we find out that if you take the mark of the beast, then the wrath of God will be poured upon you. And it's not just, just the wrath, it's the wrath without mixture. That means it's full blast. There's no holding back. It's not diluted, it's not watered down. And that sounds a whole lot worse than whatever the beast can inflict on those that refuse to worship him. And so here we, we find out that there's, there's this, again, this battle and this division of the world between two types of worship a worship of God and a worship of the beast, a false worship. And so there comes a decision that needs to be made. Where will our allegiance be? And there's a warning there letting us know the consequence of not worshiping God. Now, this seems pretty depressing at some point when you get there. But the message doesn't end there because the final part is a message of hope. John, who was writing these things, was receiving this message. After he, he wrote the three angels, he also sees this, which is amazing in verse 12. It says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So, so John doesn't just see people that are worshiping the beast. No, he sees a people that are obedient. They obey God in all things. They obey His commandments, all ten of them, including the fourth one. They, they follow God whithersoever He leads them. They follow the Lamb whithersoever He goeth. And they have the faith of Jesus. Now, I wish I could expand on that, but if you have enough time and you go study, you're going to find out that through the Scripture, you're going to come to a realization that this passage that says the faith of Jesus is nothing less than the experience 
of righteousness by faith. That is what having the faith of Jesus is, is to have received the experience of righteousness by faith, from justification to sanctification and victory over sin to eventually what will come to be glorification when Jesus comes again. And so this is what this three angels message is all about. This is a message that is present truth for us today. And if you pay attention, you see that these things, yes, are indeed happening today way more than they have ever been. Having all these thoughts now in your mind, and I know it's a lot, these are the things that we need to be out there. We need to be the messenger sharing the everlasting gospel. And I want to leave you with these final words from the book Evangelism. It says, We thank the Lord with all the heart that we have precious light to present before the people. And we rejoice that we have a message for this time which is present truth. The tidings that Christ um, is our righteousness has brought relief to many, many souls. And God says to his people, go forward. God wants us to be out there and to present these things. Now, obviously, I get it. That's a lot. It's not something that you share in five minutes. It's not something that you stand at the door and you just tell the people, no. But once you begin sharing your testimony, people get interested. They want to know about the gospel. They want to know about Jesus. They want to know about the final events. They want to know what's going to take place. And this is when we get to share the everlasting gospel. And so today, like every other day, I can only encourage you, go and witness and go tell the people the great thing that God has done for you and the great things that he will be doing in a very short future. And so with these things in mind, let us pray. Father, we, we want to thank you. For Lord, yes, many things are coming up on this world. Many things are happening right now. But Lord, you have not let, left us in ignorance. You have not left us in the dark. Father, you've given us this beautiful, precious message of the everlasting gospel. You have given us present truth that we may know, Lord, what is coming upon us and where we ought to be in our walk. And so, Father, I thank you, Lord, for not having left us, but having been with us all this time. I pray now, Lord, that as we absorb these truths, absorb this message, and as we dwell upon them, as we put them in remembrance always, that we be not neglectful and negligent to study and to share these things, that, Lord, you will empower us, you will give us the right words, the right tact, the right attitude, the right desire, that you will give us a love for souls, that we may be going out there and doing, Father, the work that you've given your people and your church. Father, forgive us for the time that we've held back, for the time that we were ignorant, for the time that we were lazy. And now, Lord, do what you must so that we may be your messengers. And I thank you, Father, for all you have done and all you will do. And I pray all of this in the only name I can come to you with, and that's the name of our Savior and our Lord Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, and also our righteousness. Amen.